Welcome to the Appliance Educator Podcast, presented by Z-Line Kitchen and Bath, attainable luxury designed in Lake Tahoe. On today's episode of the podcast, we're joined by one of the big names in the YouTube DIY scene, Alex from Mr. Build It is on the podcast. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Appliance Educator Podcast, and we have got a phenomenal guest today. We're welcoming Alex from Mr. Build It. Alex, how are you doing today? Hey, good, guys. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And as always, I'm joined by my partner in crime, Nick from Appliance Educator. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I've got my new uh, Appliance Educator swag today. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Stay tuned. There's going to be some swag coming to the website. Yeah. So. <laughs> Merch on its way. Yeah. Um, you know, we're really thrilled to have Alex from Mr. Build It join us on the podcast. The guy does phenomenal DIY content. And even though he's very humble on his channel and usually says, oh, I'm not a pro and he's incredibly forgiving about what he does, he does some phenomenal work. So we're really happy to have you today, Alex. Thanks for joining us. Cool. That's kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we just want to dive right into it. Yeah. So where did Mr. Build It come from and where did it start? Like you obviously say you're not a professional, but yeah great right? work <laughs> yeah 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 uh so probably six seven years ago uh no it has to go before that we were married for nine we're going on 10 years and when we got married um uh, we you know we were living like any other couple just broke we got pregnant with our first kid uh my wife had an incredible style and taste and um we couldn't we kind of furnished our home with all the things that were kind of hand-me-downs from her parents and I uh, I just kind of uh, wanted to give it a try to see if I could at least not buy, but at least create these things that are somewhat similar aesthetically to the things that my wife likes. And I would just give it a shot. And so from that point on, I would try it, fail it, learn something new from it. And then um, eventually just kind of kept putting it on social media and it just kind of grew what it is today. Before you kind of build up this Mr. Build It empire, uh, what kind of experience did you have, you know, with the workshop and everything? Cause seeing your channel now, and yeah. again, you're incredibly humble, but you know, it, was it kind of your first projects right off the bat or what kind of experience did you have in, in projects like this before starting out? Yeah, that's a great question. So my background, uh, I graduated college, uh, as a respiratory therapist. So before I officially retired from that to do content full time, that's what my career was prior to that, while I was still in school and we got married. The only experience I really had was uh, around cars and automotive. So my dad kind of worked on, I don't know, we were immigrants. So he worked like at a legit like chop shop where he would like weld two cars together or, or do whatever that kind of stuff. And uh, I kind of started quickly learning how to, you know, change gaskets on manifold and, you know, change clutches on cars. So cars is really the only thing I knew how to do at least figure out. Uh, and those are the only tools I had. I don't think I've ever owned a saw or anything like that. And it wasn't until when I moved uh, to Idaho, where my wife is, and where we started our family and her family's from here. Um, I got probably my very first tools from her dad, who used to do tile back in the day. But being a, an immigrant himself, he had, you know, saws and hammers and um, miter saws. And uh, he just kind of was really gracious and gave me a bunch of these hand-me-downs that are probably 20 years old. And uh, from that point on, that's where it just kind of uh, out of the gates. That's where it kind of went. Nice. That kind of goes into a question we're going to ask you is as a beginner DIYer, like what are the essential tools that you would go after that, you know, aren't going to break the bank and uh, yeah. you'll get a majority of your work done? So, uh, yeah, another great question. Um, you know, the mistake that I made, it was, I always had tool envy. So I always thought I needed the tool to do something. And I think that's a big lie. I, I think if you're innovative enough, I mean, have you guys ever seen there's this YouTube channel called uh, something primal where these guys with two sticks that are like digging these, these crazy mansions underneath the ground with tools and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah, I, out of nowhere. Yeah. And they're getting these millions of views and these things look like a resort. So I, uh, I think that's an important aspect to consider is, and if I was to tell me seven years ago, uh, forget about the tools, just get the thing that will get it done. Um, so with that being said, I would say uh, a miter saw is strictly convenience. It's not important. You can use a circular saw, but that being the case, get yourself one of those classic five piece sets you know, that has a, a circular saw and uh, a, a drill slash driver 
and then maybe a reciprocating saw. And from that point on, you have, for the most part, everything you'll need to start tackling projects at your house, right? And, and when it comes to building furniture pieces, uh, you're kind of halfway there. After that, throw in yourself a little table saw. And if budget is an issue, like it always is, because it's hard to convince our spouses to give us the money for that or let us spend the money on that, um, you really educate yourself from that point on is how to make jigs for your table saw. Right, so you can have a sled to make cross cuts, which is exactly what uh, a fancy miter saw will do. You'll have uh, different sleds that will make certain kind of joinery uh, or a very accurate miter uh, cut. So uh, you can create yourself your own out of scrap wood jigs for that table saw, and you could accomplish anything you want. Um, I, I can argue that probably for five hundred bucks, you can get yourself going with a solid Craigslist finding or Facebook finding, and and a little bit of research. Yeah, those good brands, man. Those tools will last you your life if you yeah. make money. And then if you find them used, even better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, 100%. And, and, and that's kind of the argument, right? So like I used to tell everybody, hey, get this brand or that brand. It'll last you forever. But it's when you're not doing anything yet, it's hard to be like, well, I'm going to go and get myself the, uh, the fanciest thing that's out there. It's really hard to do that. You know, it's, I just outgrow, get into something that's not going to break the budget and then outgrow it. That's kind of the way to go. Well, and speaking of growth, then, you know, seven years down the line and you've done all these different projects and it it really sounds like you kind of just were, Hey, from the ground up, I'm going to teach myself as I go. Mm -hmm. Do you have a forte now? And and have you kind of found a niche? Cause it seems like you take a little bit of everything on, but what's kind of your forte these days? Um, you know, I started with just making mostly furniture pieces. Um, I always had a dream when I finally committed to actually starting Mr. Bullet, I've always had a dream to have a YouTube channel or be a air quote influencer. Um, and then I, the only way to get me to that place was kind of replicating what other people were doing. So if other people are, are building, uh, uh, coffee tables or dressers, I build coffee tables and dressers and post about it and then write them on my blog. Um, and then you, <laughs> whenever you follow somebody else's footsteps, you're never going to see growth. You're just going to see a little bit of a blueprint to try to eventually get you somewhere. But you're frustrated enough to finally figure out your own path. And that was the path that I took till I realized, I think my path that's like carving out my own way is going to be like home or model stuff. And it was going to be big stuff. So when other influencers were building coffee tables, that'll take them you know, a couple of days to build and they can bust out videos like that. I wanted to do the projects that nobody wanted to do because they took too long and they cost too much money. Um, and oftentimes they're not profitable if you want to go full time. So those are the things that I kind of went into. And that's kind of been the path that's, that was carved out for me that I've been kind of embracing as like home reno stuff. Mm. Do you feel like there was a, a major project along the way that was kind of like the light bulb moment where you're like, after I, yeah. did, I kind of saw the light of the new direction. Yeah. Talk to us. about. Yeah. That. Yeah. 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 So there was a project, uh, maybe four years ago, three, three, three or four years ago, three years ago, where I did, um, <laughs> I did, uh, I built a stair staircase railing. And it's a funny story that every time I do a project or I pitch it to my wife, um, she kind of gets her own creative ideas brewing when she's like, maybe we should do that if that's what you're going to tackle. And it's usually some kind of piece that will be like, just will double the time that'll take me to do, you know, like just makes it so much more complicated. And in this particular scenario, it was these staircases that I did in our house that had, it was kind of enclosed where it was like a pony wall going up and then the stair, the pony wall goes away and it's just the staircase itself. And I wanted to open it up. So I knocked down this pony wall and I was committed to kind of getting like a black metal railing going through it so you can see through it so it'll open it up and then uh, put wood treads and, uh, to match the hardwood floors and not the carpet that was there. And then she decides to come up with this genius idea of putting these white um, uh, stair, what do they call it? Uh, kind of like the riser part that like your foot. So you step on the tread and then the back part of the thing, of the stair, right? The part you'd be looking at. Well, there was like 17, 18 stairs and she wanted these like Chevron style patterns that would be coming across each individual 17 tread, like, like a texture thing. And she wanted them white <laughs> and the, the floors were oak. It's a great design and she's seen it somewhere else. So that's where the inspiration came from. But I knew how much of a pain of butt it would be to build them. 
to make um, flush and not, you know, you can't just make the same size. Each one has to be its own dimension because stairs kind of do this with drywall. And, um, and being white, I knew that with kids and all of us, like we're just going to stub our feet in front of it and then it's just going to get dirty and it's going to look terrible. Well, I, from that project, I kind of learned that whenever she overcomplicates a project, uh, those videos only explode for me. <laughs> and so that was my first actually official viral video that went out. Uh, I posted it and I went camping and I think in like 24 hours, it had a hundred thousand views. And I was a small account at that point. I think I was, uh, I maybe had like 15,000 subscribers on YouTube. I wasn't doing anything on average, a video would be doing like 3000 views. And I went back from camping and I just got service to get like firewood and like my mind was blown. And so from that point on that video did long, like in the future, like now looking back at it, I think the video did like multi, 5 million, I don't know views and uh that was the first project and i think why that was a project that kind of helped shape the way or attraction is because i was one of the first people that decided to bring a welder inside the house and weld the staircase on it all right so uh yeah we're back um slight technical difficulty but you know what ha it happens since we're in the 22nd generation century no no that's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a project guy not a numbers guy but anyway, <laughs> Alex, he wanted to jump back with you you know it, it sounded like you're kind of teeing up to uh kind of finding the brand for mr build it and uh one of the key projects that kind of opened the doors for you to kind of know your niche on the content you wanted to make yeah the, the problem I, I made and i think everybody does this is they tend to uh, mimic or imitate other content creators that they like. Um, for me, it was like Casey Neistat and all that stuff. Um, and uh, as I was creating stuff with uh, Casey Neistat kind of feel, I was basically making coffee tables and weird little gadgets and gizmos that I thought were cool. Uh, and, and nothing happened at all. Like no momentum, just because you're kind of put on the 20th page of Google or YouTube. And um, I decided to take a, a swing at... And the thing as content creators, like you, if there's anything around the house, you might as well film it and create some content, especially as an up and coming one. So uh, we were doing these stairs, we were remodeling our stairs and they're kind of closed off. They had this pony wall thing. And uh, I decided to knock down the pony wall, put some like nice wooden treads on there that are not um, carpet. And then um, like a backer face, the toe kick part to each step that like 18 of them that I had this like Chevron pattern. Well, the, the, <laughs> The interesting thing is every time I take on a project, my wife gives her two cents on it, which makes it so much better, but it makes it so much harder on my end, that which brings a lot of frustration. And, uh, but they always do really well. And that was the first time I recognized that that would be the secret sauce. Uh, we ended up bringing a welder into the house and uh, I saw these people make these comments. It's like, how is this guy a DIY? He's bringing this welder into this house. There's hardwood floors and uh, he's just like welding up these stair treads or not stair treads, the stair railing. And from that point on, I just kind of saw that it, in my space, everybody knew that uh, home improvement stuff did well, but it, it's just like chip and join a game kind of stuff. But nobody wanted to do it over and over again because how much work and how much it costs to create that kind of content. But I had to kind of figure out how to double down, how to do that kind of content and make it efficient enough that I could constantly replicate that kind of uh, idea, basically. Yeah, maybe maybe have a return on it at one point, if if at all. Well, the return is always there, right? The return is, especially when you are in the niche of uh, like home renovation stuff, you're essentially in a position where brands are paying you money to remodel your house to increase the equity in it, right? So you're, you know, you're, you're flipping it regardless. It's uh, so you will make that on the other side, but you know, when the business model is established, you could position a way where they are not only paying you to remodel your house, but they're also paying you by you creating the content. You have Google AdSense was paying you your salary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've kind of set up that, you know, you came into this with not a, a bunch of professional experience and, and kind of seeing yourself, if anything, kind of a carpenter at, at most, but, you know, you're bringing in some heavy equipment and seeing what you've got on your channel now with your workshop and everything um, for that home DIY person who probably one of the big gaps is going to be, I don't know what this machine is. I don't know where to get it. What do you think is kind of a, a good way to get in the process of, Hey, you can do it yourself. Don't be afraid to get the equipment the pros are going to use. Yeah, great question. I think the lie that we always believe 
is um, we hide behind the idea that it has to be perfect, right? Uh, that's one of the excuses I was here is that I'm just such a perfectionist. I'm afraid that if I was to try this, I would drive myself crazy and not getting it just right, perfect. Um, and I think the, that perfection excuse drives us away from all the things. Um, so tools are, are another thing like that, where they go, well, I bet I could do that too. But if only I had that tool that costs eight hundred dollars to go to to it must be nice, you know. Everybody could do that if they had this. The problem is it's all excuses. And end of the day, it's how badly do you want this, right? So if you're just a uh, a weekend warrior, um, and I mean this is even easier. If you're married and you have you're a homeowner, ninety uh, percent of the times your wife your wife wants to create that nice, comfortable home, right? Whether it's a coffee table, dining room table, or knock down a wall and put in a bathroom. Um, it's just guys. Guys are always the guy, the, the people that are part of the, 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 the speed bump. So um, if you pitch it to your spouse that, hey, I could do this if we allocate the funds for that tool, then what ends up happening, you own that tool and you just go from project to project. So um, it's, it's one thing when you don't know um at all what that tool is and that's a that's you know you just grow into it right like do things with the tools that you know and understand how they work and then as your skills evolve then you can go well i saw somebody using this tool that really kind of sped up the process let me learn about that tool let me see if it's worth the investment but anything outside of that is just people creating more and more excuses to not do anything to which i say just just do it throw yourself off a cliff and do it yeah, so you're really promoting the uh, carpe diem attitude of DIY. Seize the day, right? It, the project. Yeah, I think we all live in a time. Uh, I mean, we. I think we're always. I don't know if it's an ancestral thing, but we're always like we always want to play it safe. We don't want to do the uncomfortable. We'd rather go to the nine to five job that we hate. Um, but in the back part of your brain, you're like, well, maybe I could start this woodworking business, or I could start this, uh, you know, retail business, or I could start this online endeavor. Well, I mean, the fear and excuses is what stops you. Sometimes you just got to throw yourself off the cliff and fight or flight. Awesome. Awesome attitude. And, and I think in your answer, you even teed me up with my next question that I think also relates to high risk, high reward, doing projects and making content with your partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. So my wife, she's, um, She's a influencer as well. So she's in the, 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 the design world uh, in a furniture or home decor kind of stuff. And uh, she's got her own online presence. And she and I both have a podcast together that we co-host. And everything's kind of intertwined together. Now, to a lot of people, I, I do hear people say things that I can't imagine working with my spouse. My, you know, we'd kill each other or something like that. I think that the problem goes deeper than that in those families. I think my wife and I, we've been married for 10 years. We have three kids. Um, from the day one, we've always, our communication was always laughter. Um, so it made it easy to do what we do. Um, and so we've also learned to like appreciate what one person contributes. So to me, it's building. She appreciates that I do have a, a knack for design. So uh, I don't have to, you know, deal with the whole, my husband doesn't know style. Um, and then on her end, I respect like tremendously her level of expertise in style and design. So oftentimes uh, I, I will say like, Hey, what do you think we're going to do with this or which direction you want to take? So it's um, I'm very lucky because we just, we, we have a good flow of communication and we, we like to be around each other. I think that was the big thing. We never really feel like, all right, we're not filming today together or we're not doing a podcast today because I'm pissed off with you. It's more of like, we just don't let things get to us just because we, there's, a, there's, a, a, <laughs> there's a great saying that I kind of live my life by is marriage gets either better or bitter. And I think if you're quick to cut that bitterness out, it, everything else just gets better. That's awesome. That's yeah. some relationship advice coming to you <laughs> from Mr. Vilda. Yeah. yeah. I'm it's, it's, this is the it's hard to do projects with your spouse because you will, you'll have different ideas. You have different ways of working. And I, yeah. So props to you guys. Yeah. Alex, it hey. sounds, it sounds like uh, each time you guys envision the next project, it's a very collaborative process and it's kind of two like-minded individuals kind of collaborating on what you're going to see forward. I mean, is there a typical pattern you guys take on when you're kind of envisioning what the next project's going to be? Yeah, we kind of do have a pattern. Um, 
kind of like I said, going back into it, she trusts me a lot with the design, not decor. I, I, I can't do decor, but I could do design. So for example, when we bought this house, so for the YouTube series, we've been, we're, we're a solid year into uh, the series called the Concrete Slab House Rental, which this is a house that is a concrete mono slab, slab on grade. There's no crawl space. And that means everything plumbing electrical runs through the slab, right? So the entire se uh, series is probably 20 episodes deep so far. But when we bought the house, she didn't see the vision of what I wanted to do with it, right? This older couple that lived here. It's not an old house. I think it's like a 2004 or something like that. But it's completely outdated to not her style or my style. So when we came into the, the project, it was me going, hey, this is a solid. It has good bones in, in the case that the ceilings are tall. There's big windows. I can knock that out. I can move that. She before couldn't see that potential. Um, now she's getting better at it, but she's also getting better at trusting me with it. So whenever there's a project in mind, so let's say we're going to be tackling the, the master bathroom here in the next month or so. Um, I have the vision for it already. Um, and typically I'll present to her what I'm thinking about doing. And about three quarters of the idea she likes, and then she'll add a thing that will complicate it for me. So, uh, you know, or like a part that I'll disagree with. So like this particular bathroom, she's already mentioned, it's got a nice uh, classic jacuzzi that's built into the top, into the, you know, you have to step into it. It's a little outdated and, and she, she wants to rip that out and put a, one of those vessel bathtubs, you know, the stand up ones that look like a Victorian style. To me, I think it's a silly thing, but because she agrees with me three quarters the way of the project, the rest of it, I kind of just go with what she wants to do. It's 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 our version of give and take. Um, I think it's worked really well thus far. Um, it's very rare that I'll present to her like a, like a, a dining table or something like that. And I'll be like, hey, uh, I have no idea what I'm doing with this. It's more of like, hey, here's five pictures. Here's the feel I like. What do you think about it? She's like, oh, awesome. Can we just do this with a stain? I want it to look like cool. And that's typically the, the workflow. Nice. So you're talking about your house in 2004 is made-ish. Um, does that all have the, the appliances um, that were came stock with the house? Or are you guys still shopping for new ones or you already replaced those? Yeah, we already replaced it. So the kitchen was probably kitchen flooring and interior paint was one of the first projects we did. And so the kitchen alone, I think was like a 12 video series. And so, yeah, we ended up taking out the old double oven that was off to the side and the single drop in electric stove top, you know, got, so we kind of gave it the more modern approach. Well, since we are the appliance educators, we have to ask you yeah. what was your decision-making process and what were you looking for to, was it just style, was it functionality or less? Yeah. That, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, when uh, when we replaced uh, in our last house, our, what was it? I think it was a, a GE um, refrigerator that was a hand-me-down from her parents that had basically been around in her since we've been married, plus another maybe five years, so 15 years, and it finally kind of kicked the can. We, uh, I kind of took on, I kind of surprised her with the refrigerator because she hated how small it was. And so I, and this was, uh, I think right at the beginning of the pandemic. So one of the biggest uh, discouraging thing is seeing our supply chain and how it's not made in the USA and how everything's coming from uh, import. Um, going into the decision-making process, I, I was basically at the store going, hey, I want something that is solid enough that could be repaired, not just thrown away. Um, like back in the good old days in the 60s and 70s, when you called a, a, a guy to come fix it, as opposed to going, hey, we just can't get these parts. It's just a, a one-time thing. Um, so I wanted Made in the USA, and I wanted to be, be able to be worked on. And so that's how we landed on the Whirlpool. And uh, I mean, we haven't had it too long, too long but it's, it's so far, it's, it's kind of done what it's needed to do. Yeah, that's a good brand. We we uh we do a lot of reviewing and stuff, and they are usually yeah. with the solid, solid. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, go, now that was that was my kind of uh, the research behind it. Now, uh, that's we, like I said, we bought it probably like two years ago. Going into this house, uh, all the appliances were bought in the summertime, and my wife went strictly off of looks. Like she did no research about 
you know, what are people saying? Do they last long? What are the issues with that? She could care less about that stuff. She was like, cafe appliances look awesome. Let's get cafe. Yeah. And it's, it's irresponsible, but you know, I, it's one of those situations where because we don't stay in these houses more than maybe four to five years, and then we just go into the next house. Mm -hmm. uh, it's essentially a way to flip a house and not worry, just focus on aesthetics. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Especially with the equity, right? Cause you get all those new appliances mm -hmm. in there and they're much more updated when you put the house back yeah. on. Yeah. Hey guys, Drew from the Appliance Educator Podcast here. And I just wanted to take a minute out to talk about our amazing sponsor, Z-Line Kitchen and Bath. You've heard the guests and the hosts talk about this amazing brand and all the attainable luxury that they create right here in the heart of Lake Tahoe, USA. From freestanding ranges to ventilation, dishwasher or microwave, to everything you'll need to complete your next bathroom project, Z-Line Kitchen and Bath is bringing luxury into your next project. Um, exactly. you know, with all the different projects you've done, do you have one you've hated or is there kind of that project when it comes up, yeah. this is going to be the worst <laughs> one? Yeah. Tell us about it's, it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's funny. I, I was always asked this question and I, uh, and I never really had a really, really good answer. I just kind of try to find something. And then there's a project that I'm working on right now uh, is actually a project that in the record books has to be the most stressful uh, and the most pain in the butt project. And it's a gaming desk that I decided to build uh, for my oldest boy. He's a huge gamer. Uh, I promised him when he turns 10, I'll help, I'll use, help, use my platform to help him kind of start up like a gaming channel, like a streaming thing that I'll like play with him and, and all that stuff. And so I decided to be like, well, you know, it'd be cool. I, uh, I put out a gaming bunk bed that I built for my kid uh, this last summer and it took off. And I was like, oh, maybe there's this, niche of like gamers at like gaming setups. So I was like, let's try a desk. And this part of the desk was a cool design. And I'm, it's finally everything turned out a lot better than it started. But uh, I cut out these channels along the side profile of the tabletop. And then there's the, the computer monitor uh, section that lifts up again. So that has a channel down the middle. And then the legs are these wide, six inch wide rectangular things that are mitered. But anyways, down the middle, it has channels cut out and then I LED strip the whole entire thing every channel that I cut out so it kind of looks like something from Tron right so you have every like silhouette of it like lit up LEDs and well the trick was putting LEDs in there but then pouring uh, epoxy into that so it's you don't see the LEDs and because um, you have to create this little op op opacity that when the lights are off you don't see those lights well I to approach it, I took, you know, you take Tyvek, which is, you know, siding tape, and I created these molds and I secured everything, put silicone around. So it's basically creating that if you pour on top, uh, all three sides down below and the sides are, are concealed. So you're pouring, it fills all the channels and you're done. Well, it turned out that I don't know if I used the wrong chemicals, but the epoxy leaked and epoxy is extremely expensive. It's like $300 for like half a gallon, right? And I had to, and, and then on top of that, you have to let it sit for about seven days. So for, it doesn't start even hardening or stiffening till like day four or something. Mm -hmm. And so it was a solid like five days of me coming out and then everything would be poured out and leaked out out of the molds from a small little crevice. So I had to report three times and uh, my entire shop floor was covered with epoxy. Uh, it's, uh, my tools are covered with epoxy. My boots are covered in epoxy. Everything's in epoxy. Uh, so it was probably the most stressful. It, it's the same stress as if like you're, you're, you're screwing a hole into your, into your wall to like hang like that picture frame. And you, there happens to be like a water line behind it. And now you have water shooting out of it. That's like three, four days of me, like every single day, you know, pour the epoxy, all of a sudden you're seeing seeping out and you can't stop it. You can't put a patch on it. It's just, you have to just like, you know, just try to collect it and then figure it out from there. So what was your, so, yeah. what, what was the ultimate uh, happening of the table? Did it ever come to fruition? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in the middle of it. I'm actually uh, tomorrow's uh, like we film like the big reveal and the outro, and then we put the video together and it's going to come out in a couple of weeks. But um, yeah, it, it, it came out great. Uh, but my approach to it, because it would seep out in random spots every single time that my approach to fix it. And this is like, I'm still trying to figure out if I was to instruct somebody how to do it, like right the first time, I still don't know how to give them the right instruction. But what I end up having to do 
is every time it would seep out, I'd have to let that epoxy come out, dry off the orifices that created the holes. So basically the epoxy is now creating a layer over that hole, patched itself, and then refill it on top again. Mm. It's, the, it's the worst piece of advice and it's the <laughs> worst nightmare I've ever been part of, but there it is. I now have a story. Doing the same step of a project every day over for a week, basically, and it's and it's just leaking. Your your water is breaking through the walls. All it, it, it was ridiculous. What are, what yeah. are you doing to clean the tools and the floor and everything? You just got to scrape it. Yeah. So if it's if it's a puddle and it's solidified, you can take a chisel and break it off. But then you, it, I, you know, like if you have epoxy covered on the you know like your garage floor epoxy that they roll on, that'll pop it off. So it's bare concrete after that. Mm-hmm. But for tools. Uh, as long as you don't let it sit for the full seven days to harden or the five days, uh, it's just a bunch of acetone to start wiping everything down. The label says you can use soap and water, but I've never, I mean, soap and water is about the only thing that'll take it off your hands after like 20 minutes, but tools like you just hit with, uh, acetone and expect it to still to be glossy later on. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it'll add a nice finish yeah, to, your, to your tools. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Press it up. Um, another project we wanted to ask you about, uh, Nick's getting ready to, uh, he's in the planning phases of building an outdoor kitchen. And we saw you've got some awesome content on that. Um, Nick, you kind of want to walk through it and yeah. pick his brain um, for So some... I know there was, I, watching the videos, I know there are some steps where you're like, oh, I should have done this and should have done that instead. Just, I'd like to hear your, your tips and maybe some advice before I, I, I really get going. Yeah. So, um, there's a few ways of doing it. And I've seen a lot of people do it in different ways, but the way I did it is I took, cause you're constantly battling two things, weather, right? So you, you don't want rain to destroy it after two years and you're battling a uh, fire hazard, right? You don't want this thing to all of a sudden start a fire. Um, so you have to always balance those things. So I, for weather, I used, used pressure treated lumber and then wrapped it with OSB. I basically treat it as if I'm building a house, right? And then after that, I would use, um, uh, uh, chicken wire and then thin set to put uh, 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 the veneer uh, bricks on it. Um, and for where the grill sits, I wrapped it with aluminum uh, sheeting. Uh, therefore, that is my heat containment and fire retardant, if you will. Mm-hmm. Now, um, what I would do differently to take one thing off the equation is uh, you always have to consider the fire part. I would doing it over again, I would buy the aluminum studs that they have. Like they would, when you buy a warehouse or lease a warehouse, when they put up walls, they're using aluminum studs yep. and they're a little more expensive, but you're now not concerned about a fire hazard because you don't have any wood lumber and you're not concerned about uh, weather to destroy it. So uh, going back into it, I would increase your budget by an extra, maybe 200 bucks, but then you just eliminated this whole thing of like sleeping with one eye open. Yeah. And I imagine you kind of have similar climate to us up in Idaho that we do in Reno. It's hot in the summer and can be drastically wet and snowy and icy during the winter. Um, I actually met with a company out here that produces, it's called elephant's feet or something like that, where it's like a prosthetic shell and they can print it. And it's, it's like, all weatherproof. And I guess they, it's what they use for airport tar mats too, these days, because it's so resistant so to moisture the elements. It can't get yeah, inside. Can't get inside. So it won't crack it. And then it's, it doesn't get hot to the touch either. So that's something that we'll do a video on um, in the near future, just kind of review it and give the details. But I thought that was a really cool uh, new product that's on the market these days. And it's, and it works as it's, a, is it a paste or is it actual physical it's a mold? So it, uh-huh. you can create your whole wall with it and your whole boundaries of where you're going to insert everything. And it's mm-hmm. kind of like a concrete 3d printing kind of thing almost. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it, the material, I, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's a, it's new on the market and it looks really good for people that live in really harsh weather environments that has, you know, the stability to last. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I know they have a similar product right on the market for, to replace like pouring concrete uh, or brickling. It's these like foam uh, molds that you stack up and you put rebar through and then you just pour concrete through it on top and then take your molds off. Or I think the molds even stay there. I don't remember, but yeah, they're coming out with really cool ideas for the future. Yeah. Science is cool. 
Science is cool. <laughs> and back to your channel, we saw that you've got a lot of videos on, on tech. Is there anything new on the market that you're kind of excited about going into uh, 2022? Yeah, you know, when I started my channel, I uh, I kind of did any anything and everything. Uh, I even had a video that I deleted because I was so embarrassed about it, where I was like doing like tips how to detail your car. Like you just don't know in the beginning. And so sure. I did some tech review stuff, some smart home stuff. I got lucky with one or two videos. I think Ring was a really fun one. Um, but I'm not really that knowledgeable in tech that comes out. I will say that um, there's... I, we were, we had a, a friend of mine, Ben Uwe, on the podcast uh, last week, and he was talking about they're coming out with this, like these uh, appliances that have like Wi-Fi capabilities built in for you to be able to control it or regulate it through your phone. Mm -hmm. um, now, personally, I can't, and this is my argument to him, I was like, I can't really justify it. Like the selling point of regulating anything on my refrigerator because it's like those settings it's like it's like a vcr setting or what's the vcr anymore right <laughs> uh, it's like a tv setting like once you set it up you're done right yeah. so i can't imagine me going okay well i don't want my freezer to be zero and my my, my refrigerator itself be a different you just keep it there but um things like grills and pellet grills and smokers um things that you do end up tweaking things those are cool um i know the Garage interest, garage opener industry, it, they have a lot of value. I have the Chamberlain uh, system that's put in where it's, you can open it through your phone. There's cameras that you can constantly, and that's a big selling point for me is cameras that you can keep an eye in your garage. You know, in the summertime, garage doors open, tools are there. Anybody can just run in, grab something and run out. And it's just nice to have that. So I guess that's what I'm excited about is, is smart garage door openers. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I didn't think about that, but that's definitely something to integrate and protection yeah because we're seeing so much more of that in the appliance world especially like everybody mm -hmm. wants to throw an ir sensor and a camera on uh -huh. the ventilation so it's like you can watch a, f a food video or watch yourself cook and you know when that starts going into yeah. like ranges it's like i can see the convenience of preheating but also the safety of do i want to control my range from my phone when i'm not home mm -hmm. yeah i mean we, we were already butt dial people with our smartphones imagine like you butt turn on your range and yeah, yeah, that that doesn't sound like a great day when you need to rush home and turn it off manually because your phone turned it off. Right. <laughs> yeah. The real right. advantages I see in it is when you get an air code and you can pull up your phone and in the app it'll read that air code that your your appliance is going through, and then it just links you to the exact person the you support. need to call the the support team yeah. that you can go after and help you out from there, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about because you have all the yeah. information being read right on your phone. That's the one big plus I see in the Wi-Fi coming into appliances? You know, um, it's interesting how furnaces work because you can have a furnace that's still 20 years old and it, it doesn't have a Wi-Fi capability, but it has something as simple as a diagnostic blinking light. And it's like, if it blinks, you know, a pattern of, you know, three quick blinks and then one steady blink, and then you just look at your little index, you're like, okay, well, that means this is out. And then and then you can either Google it or you can call a guy, but you already kind of know. And so I'm, a, I'm surprised that appliances don't have that already, like a refrigerator or a microwave, uh, like dishwashers go out often, right? Um, I had a mistake where I bought uh, like a, an entry level Samsung in our last house uh, dishwasher. And literally in two months, the what sounded to me and from the things I read online, the impeller, I believe, would make that every time I'd wash. And it's frustrating because you already threw your box out. You're not going to try to find the receipt to go return it. And it's washing just fine, but it's got an annoying sound. And uh, yeah, it's, it would be nice to have little diagnostic tools. Yeah, I'm not a, we're, we're not a Samsung company here. <laughs> yeah, I keep no. hearing that. I, I, I keep hearing that from people where it's like, I, first of all, I haven't met anybody who's like a diehard Samsung fan, except I'm a fan of their TVs. Like, like I've gone to like the Vizios and all these other ones and they're junk, but then Samsung TVs are great, but Samsung appliances, that's one thing that you always hear people like have some negative. Uh, yeah, about. They're, they're newer to the appliance game and they have some kinks to work out for sure. But I think they just try to overload the tech in it and it's just something yeah. that doesn't need to be overloaded with tech. I think that's a big thing we're, we're just seeing in the appliance world in the last two decades is you have these giant uh, consumer electronics firms that are saying, hey, we have another device to sell. We can move a lot of our convenience features that you would have in a television or a phone 
over to an appliance and rather than really looking at, hey, what's the nature of making the best dishwasher? Well, what are the consumer appliance level features we can just introduce to a dishwasher? Yeah. So, you know, uh, it kind of it kind of transferred over. Uh, it, we were talking a little bit earlier. I, I had some knowledge before building in the car industry. And I grown up in a family of car guys like my dad would, you know, rebuild cars and I remember he would always speak so well of Toyotas and Lexus, right? He's like, these are, especially as immigrants, any immigrant family, they always love Toyotas and Lexuses and, and Hondas. And I remember uh, just constantly hearing BMWs, Mercedes, Audis having issues once they're out of warranty. And I remember uh, having a friend who was a BMW engineer, or not engineer, but a mechanic. And he was telling me that the reason that is, is that Lexus and Toyota and Honda has had the same tech for the last 20 years, the same heated uh, steering wheels about the fanciest thing, uh, the same navigation, the same tilting seats, that, that's it. But then you have people who are trying to be these pioneers in the industry and constantly come up with brand new things like the, like BMW came out with the ability to display the hologram on the windshield of like your speed when they first did it. Um, and then all these other bells and whistles and sensors. And the next thing you know, those are the things that are going out because they didn't have enough time to work out the kinks on them. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it kind of makes sense. What the thing, thing yep, absolutely. Similar thing with, with appliances. It's think about what you really need in the appliance and try to get those on the top level before you look at anything fancy. That's it, the best advice I can give. A, a big tip for these days too. If it's the first uh, iteration to introduce that feature, consider the supply chain when you're looking for parts and support. Because, and if you yeah. can have that support in your town. Exactly. Because one thing, you know, in working with appliances too, is there may not be a servicer who's worked on that feature in your area, because if it's brand new, you might be the first person in your state to have that in your home and they don't know exactly where or how it connects to support your product. So that's such an adult thing to do, right? Like I, I bet the kids coming up right now will never understand that because it's like when you, you know, the whole buy once cry once uh, mentality. I remember buy. I remember getting this buying on Craigslist some kind of lawnmower when we first became a homeowner, and I think I paid a hundred bucks for it. And the thing crapped out on me, so I went to the local uh, the lawn store uh, equipment store, the small ones repair shop, and I was like, "Hey, um, here's what's happening. Uh, it sounds like I need to rebuild the carburetor." And the guy is like, oh, "Based off of that model, listen, I could charge you a hundred bucks an hour, but I can't guarantee that it's getting fixed. And on top of that, parts are so hard to find for that particular lawnmower." So then coming out of that, and I was like, fine, let's go get a new lawnmower, just buy, cry once, buy once. And I'm doing all this research and like everybody's like, no, you got to make sure it's a Honda, Briggs and Stratton engine. Those things are indestructible. And so from that point on, you're like, aha, they have an endless supply of those, you know, replacement parts. I can get them tomorrow. So that's such an adult thing to do when you go, when you start doing research about the thing you're buying for the doomsday planning when it breaks. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it goes with kind of the homeowner's mentality too. If you're like, look, this is going to be mine. I'm going to take care of it. And I'm not talking about today or tomorrow. I'm talking about 10 years from now. If this is the same yeah. one, I can fix it again. Whereas, you know, back to the consumer electronics thing, I think too, with a lot of the bells and whistles, they're like, our consumer wants new and fancy. They might just flip in and out of this, get that new dishwasher every two years. There might be some from the uh, larger manufacturer angle of uh, positioning the product to be more disposable in that mm. sense, which who knows, but as we're seeing it, you know, when you iterate a totally new line every year to replace your current product line, that does kind of suggest they're not looking at the longevity of a 20 year engine you can continually replace. So for sure. And you could see that with the parts that are in it, right? Like it's kind of scary to think that you have a dishwasher that produces heat, right. To either wash or dry uh, your dishes. And then it's using plastic materials, which plastics get destroyed by heat. Right. So it's, it's a weird concept that they decided to just put that in. And yeah, it's, it's a, this is meant to last you for five years max kind of thing, if you're lucky. Yeah. yeah. So, so, do you, so, so do you guys have, I mean, the golden question that you guys probably get asked all the time, is there top three appliances or top one appliance that you guys think is like, keep that one, buy that one? There, it, It's different for every kind of appliance. So some, some, uh, manufacturers are great at dishwashers. So like, I'll give a shout out to Bosch. Bosch dishwashers are, are great. They're, yep. That thing will last you 20 years. Um, mm. But, you know, maybe their microwave isn't as good and or their ovens, but it's just 
dependent on what you're really looking for and what you need. That's probably the biggest challenge, I would say. I think I think a lot of people, when we envision our home too, especially if you see a brand that matches the aesthetic, you want everything to match. Um, and that's where I would say in our experience in doing reviews, I mean, there's a lot of companies who are pretty good at most things and have the one thing that they're best at, um, you know, with, with Bosch, I'd say Z-Line's right there, um, as, as another dishwasher, that's just going to be solid supported. And the big thing I would say for anybody looking for dishwashers, that quiet running, read your reviews, because having that dishwasher that does a good clean and you can have it on in the background while you're watching a movie with the family and it doesn't disrupt anything, you know, a good test for a dish dishwasher too. If you haven't fully committed yet, run it. If you forget that it's running, if you can leave the room and come back in and be like, is it still running? That's a great first day test Mm -hmm. on your dishwasher. And, you know, kind of to the point of, I I think a lot of consumers shop aesthetics first, and then it kind of comes down to, you know, when you're looking at a range, I mean, Wolf is is a really strong brand in that space, especially if you're like, Hey, I want something a little more professional, solid stainless, but then you go start to look and say, Hey, there's the Thermidor. There's a Z line. These are very similar. What are the features I want? And another thing that's what's your budget, what's your budget. And, and I would recommend to people too, is, uh, if you get a chance and you're in a physical showroom, if you can look in the product and look at the complexity of the wiring, I mean, two ranges that look very similar and there might be a couple thousand dollars between price point, but they're both solid stainless. They're both going to have great burners and you can open that thing. And one is a maze of circuit boards and wiring. And another one just has a few lines laid out across the top. That's also some great things to look at for when you're thinking about the three and the five year investment you want in this piece in your home. Thinking as a repairman, you can look at it and be like, I see where everything's going. I know what this line is. I know what this line is. I know what this line is. There's your problem. Yeah. Place, boom. Because if it's nine months, nine months into owning the range and you have to open it and fix it, and maybe there's a challenge with parts or a servicer in your area. If you open that thing and you can kind of identify what's going on versus you open it and you're like, I am just over my head. It's going to be a different story from there on out. So, yeah. Wow. That's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's the appliance world, baby. That's us. Yeah. And, and really the only reason we know that is from all the different things we've opened up yeah. and all the fun horror yeah. stories. I, I remember, uh, working with Matt on the appliance educator channel when we did our first dishwasher install and, you know, even following the instruction manual, you know, it was uh, three trips to home Depot later and a, a good five hour day. And mind you, neither of us had installed a dishwasher before. I think we could knock one out in an hour. Now they're pretty easy, but yeah. we don't know anything every single step is a learning mm-hmm. part of the journey you know that's exactly that's exactly part of it and, and i think a lot of people don't understand i think a lot of people are intimidated of trying these things because they're they're afraid that they don't want to go down that rabbit hole but the idea is when you do something once you kind of have an idea for the next time you're doing something right like my furnace went out when we first got in here and i know nothing about furnaces and then it was enough for me to like see what the blinking light did google it online turns out i could replace just this 15 amp fuse and the thing's back in power, but like, you gotta, you gotta go through uh, some of that sweat to, uh, and frustrations to take it onto the net. Yeah. And remember you have a deep resources of the internet where you can really almost find anything that you need. And someone in the internet world has gone through the same problem you have. So just take the time a little, dig a little bit harder for it. And yeah, I-, I always tell, I always tell people we live in the best time because we have the power of the internet. Like you said, like back, well, I mean, take it even back 20 years ago. If something happened, you'd have to go to the library, get seven books, take three sentences out of each book to have the roughest idea about how a thing works. Nowadays, I dare you not to Google something and not find it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's a perfect segue into uh, where can they find all this awesome Mr. Build It content online? (laughs) You guys can find me on uh, type in Mr. Build It on YouTube. Um, I'm sure I'll pop out there. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. It's at uh, Mr. Underscore, Mr. Build underscore it. And uh, we're on TikTok. We're on Facebook. We're, we're all over the place. Yep. And you've also got a podcast out there too that they can look for. Yeah, we have a podcast. It's on Spotify and iTunes and Google Play everywhere. It's called Next Door Neighbors. Uh, my wife and I, we talk about uh, entrepreneurship. We talk about personal development and then what's it like being a parent in the midst of all that um and uh we have a lot of fun we have a lot of fun uh we do weekly episodes and uh, a lot of good stuff there 
Awesome, Alex. We want to thank you for your time. It's been really informative. And I think you just share a lot of the same vision we do here of it's worth it, guys. Do the work, do the homework. You'll be much more satisfied those yeah. couple years it's down a, the road. It's a good feeling when you accomplish a, a goal or even just a little project and take a baby step one at a time. Yep. Yeah. And you got to eat some of your vegetables first, but then <laughs> it, you'll feel a lot better about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Alex. Thanks for your time today, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. See ya. This has been the Appliance Educator Podcast, brought to you by Z-Line Kitchen and Bath. Be sure to like, subscribe, and follow at Appliance Educator for more tips and tricks and advice to keep your home running at optimal performance. If you have any ideas or topics you'd like to hear on future episodes of the show, leave us a comment. Appliance Educator, signing off.